This is Dr. Charles Parker, and you're listening to Core Brain Journal. It's the place where I connect both fresh discoveries and interesting different perspectives from advanced mind science with the realities of real people and everyday life down on Main Street. Well, welcome aboard, folks. Dr. Charles Parker here again at Core Brain Journal, and we got a very, very interesting guy. And, you know, it, it sounds a little bit uh, odd that because we've spent so much time at Core Brain Journal thinking about vets and veteran treatments, and Dr. Kevin Kipp is going to join us today. Welcome aboard, Kevin. Uh, thanks for having me. I'm delighted to be here. So Kevin's going to be talking about accelerated resolution therapy. He's not going to be talking, this isn't anything woo woo just because the name and the idea is not familiar to you it's got to become familiar to you if you have any kind of relationship with any kind of trauma it could be veterans of course he's hooked up with veterans but we're going to talk about the evidence we're going to talk about how it's different how it has brought a whole different perspective in terms of what we can do with individuals who have various experiences uh, traumatic and challenging experiences from war so let me say a couple of words from our sponsor. I'll introduce Kevin and we'll get on to the conversation. DHA is a direct health access laboratory. Core Brain Journal is sponsored by them. They are international leaders in molecular testing for mind science details. With over 3 million studies, they provide deep experience with the usefulness of measuring, for example, methylation, cryptopyrrole, and copper challenges. They have innovative insights that improve treatment priorities through a global service with indeed a molecular focus. Connect your provider with a PDF on how and why these tests work for treatment failure at dhalab.com forward slash core, dhalab.com forward slash core. And you can also go over to listen to Dr. Bill Walsh talk about it at corebrainjournal.com forward slash 115, our most frequently downloaded episode right now. Core Brain Journal is also sponsored by nonprofit Barry Robinson Center teams in Norfolk, Virginia, where they provide fresh options to address the complexity of child and adolescent treatment failure, from behavior imbalances to substance abuse, both nationally and internationally. What they bring to the table is an interesting deep focus on data-driven biomedical advances that measure and feature specifics on what to do exactly, precisely, with treatment failure instead of the current standard of care, which so often is guesswork. Even after multiple hospitalizations or extensive outpatient work, they can provide some different answers. Review their innovative programs at barryrobinson.org forward slash core. That's B-A-R-R-Y, robinson.org forward slash core. More information coming up later in the program. So let me introduce Kevin to you. Dr. Kevin Kipp is a tenured distinguished health professor, an epidemiologist, and a biostatistician with 18 years of experience in U.S. Federal Department of Defense and industry-related, industry-funded studies. His background is interdisciplinary. We love that at Core Brain Journal with more than 170 peer-reviewed publications. This guy did not just come in from the street, guys. With a multi-million dollar funding from the U.S. Department of Defense, he established the research to improve emotional health quality of life of service members with disabilities. It's called Restore Lives. It's a center in the University of South California. Through this center, he is the leading researcher worldwide in the study of accelerated resolution therapy. It's the main reason we're having Dr. Kip with us. Accelerated resolution therapy is an emerging, brief, and evidence-based method of psychotherapy for treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder and the multiple related comorbidities, things that occur right there with PTSD. Dr. Kipp is the previous principal investigator of the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, the Dynamic Registry of Percutaneous Coronary Interventions, which enrolled approximately, get this end number, folks, 10,000 patients. He was a member of the Institute of Medicine Committee to Review the Health Effects of Vietnam Veterans of Exposure to Herbicides Over in Vietnam. This is so interesting. Dr. Kipp is a frequent reviewer of the National Institutes of Health 
and is studying a range of complementary and alternative medicine therapies for the treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. I mean, this is so interesting, Kevin. I'm so much looking forward to hearing about your report. So how did you get, I mean, where did you start? You're a deep dive guy. You're, you're into a number of important studies. You've done the research. You've published a great deal. How did all this get started? Where did you find an interest in the first place? So it's a rather interesting story that about eight years ago at my university here, the University of South Florida in Tampa, I was able to secure a little more than $2 million in congressional funding. And the focus of that funding was to look for alternative treatments for uh, service members, veterans, family members with emotional difficulties, as you sort of described. And I really, uh, as an epidemiologist and not a, a clinical practitioner, I really wanted to open up the realm of possibilities and consider you know, a range of possible options, you know, maybe rather naively. But nonetheless, I started researching uh, maybe some alternative approaches that could be considered. And here's where it's a really strange story. My mother sends me a newspaper article about a therapist up in Connecticut, a licensed marriage and family therapist who has a new method. and says, why don't you take a look at this? And uh, her name is Lainey Rosenzweig, and she turns out to be the developer of Accelerated Resolution Therapy, which I'll call ART. And I invited her down to my university to give a seminar. And uh, I had a lot of people from the Veterans Administration come over, and uh, she gave a nice seminar. And it was really kind of an out-of-box, out-of-the-box you know, approach, but really on a gut reaction. I said, you know, I really think that she might have uh, developed something rather unique and novel, and it sounded good to me. And I said, we better start studying this. You know, I've got some funding to look at alternative approaches. This fits into that category. And so why don't we start studying it? And that's what really launched the effort that uh, I started designing and conducting studies, uh, both in the civilian world and in the uh, military population. And that's how we got started. Well, that is so interesting. You know, tell us what in her presentation was the thing that just stimulated you to say, we've got to do this. I mean, I'm putting myself in your shoes. You have a door swing open. And what was the light that came out of that door? So there's about four or five things. I'll try not to make it too long of an answer. But first, just from a practical standpoint, the approach is quick. Sometimes a single session, but only a few sessions. And I knew that that would be potentially very attractive, if effective, a brief therapy. Secondarily, it used a different approach. So a lot of times when you think of psychotherapy, you think of, quote, talk therapy. And and this approach was uh, substantially different, that it had a focus on the body and the physiological sensations that happen when you have emotional experiences and you think about them. And even more intriguing, it had a focus on the brain and memory and how you can actually go in and alter or add positive material to memory. So I really got intrigued, again, quite frankly, as a novice, but you know, talk therapy to me certainly didn't seem to be a, you know, the real big gun when you're talking about something like PTSD. And I like the fact that this was taking a different approach. So that's really what attracted me. So that is very, very interesting because, you know, as a practitioner, I didn't know this about uh, art. I didn't know that that's one of the uh, redeeming qualities because we see it happen so often. People use medications for years. They're jostling this and that around. They're trying different techniques. And uh, to actually have something that's going to work in a relatively short period of time and that whole idea of time and a person's recovery, it gives them hope. I mean, they can feel like there's something we can do here. And if I practice it, I'm going to be in, in better shape. So, well, let's jump right into it. How does this work? Please tell us about it. Okay. I'll try to, uh, in a relatively brief manner, describe how a session would be conducted. So, you know, if an individual presents, and we'll simplify it with a single isolated trauma, but something very significant, maybe a firefight, loss of a loved one, but a single incident, what would normally happen is at the start of the session, the individual would first be asked to recall that experience, but in their mind. So one of the redeeming features of ART is it doesn't require verbalization. So the uh, soldier or whoever is being treated doesn't have to actually talk about it. Now they have to think about it. So the first thing that they would do is they would start to relive the experience in their mind as if it were like a movie, replaying a movie. And of course, it's a very distressing experience. So what that will inevitably do is it'll cause physiological reaction. 
because you're reliving something that's really, really traumatic. And you might get a real, real rapid heart rate or a sweating or tightness in the chest or a, a range of symptoms. And when I mention that the approach first focuses on physiology is the clinician will, will really just uh, direct the, I'm going to call it the patient, okay, to really just focus on what physiological reactions emanate from thinking about the experience. So if the patient says, I feel nauseous, the therapist will say, notice that nausea. Now, another unusual thing about the therapy, as is happening, when the clinician says, notice the nausea, they then ask the patient to follow their hand, moving from left to right, and move their eyes. This is called an eye movement therapy. So while you're thinking about the physiological reaction, you're also following a hand. And we can talk to, if you want to know the theoretical basis, why that might be helpful. And you're focusing on the, the physiological reaction and following the clinician's hand. And I'm going to break this up into pieces so we'll have some discussion so it won't be too long to describe the whole session. But what will happen is, after reliving the experience and bringing up all of the physiology that it is accompanied when you think about something really, really horrible, when you ask the person to focus on that and perform the eye movements, they will quiet down all of that response. You'll be desensitized such that the second time through, it won't be as hard. You have to do it twice, relive the experience twice. And then after that, the person will be able to think about the experience and not experience the same amount of distress. So that's the first part, and I'll stop there if you'd like to you know, ask anything about that, because then there's a second piece that's really important. Yes, please, because I, we have interviewed people, and I have several people in my practice who are trained in EMDR. So mm -hmm. what would be interesting would be how does this process, art process, differ from EMDR? And I think that's probably what you're going to tell us in just a moment, because EMDR is more locked into adjust the process of getting that eye movement stabilization, destabilization corrected. And uh, I'm not an expert on EMDR, so I'm, you probably are. I thought it'd be interesting to ask because, and I'm going to actually, when we get off, I'll hook you up with uh, serious EMDR presenters as well. But go ahead, tell us about that relationship, yeah, what you're talking about. I, I, I will, and that's a great question because this really, ART is, a variation of EMDR. So let okay. me say that in that the developer was trained in EMDR mm -hmm. and she's a very creative and insightful clinician and she noticed immediately the value of the eye movements, which we can talk more about theoretically, what we think they do in the brain and the body. There were some elements though of the EMDR protocol that she wasn't as fond of. So some of the EMDR protocol is free associative. So you'll ask the patient, well, what did that uh, bring up to you and where would you like to go now? Okay. And a big difference, there's a couple with ART, is it's far more directive. So I want you to think about it when you think about ART like a procedure. And this is not the best analogy, but it's almost like going to the dentist and you have a cavity and we're going to go in and we're going to put a filling in. And we're going to put in something that's not the real thing, meaning you're putting in a filling, but we're going to do that in a procedural manner. So when I first described to you that you'd walk through the entire experience in your mind two times, bring up all of the physiological reactions, and use the eye movements to focus on all of those, that is a very, very heavy emphasis on, again, the physical symptoms, which is more so than EMDR typically does. And that is the first phase. But if, if it's okay, I'll go into the second phase, which is substantially different from Yes, EMDR. please, if you would. That's so interesting. Thank you. Okay, so the second phase is, so I want you to think about the person's been in the session for usually only at this point, maybe 15, 20 minutes, and they've relived the experience twice through, and it's brought up a lot of physiological reaction, and that's been able to have been quieted down. And so then the next thing, which is really novel about the approach, is what's called imagery rescripting. And that's a fancy phrase, but it, what it means is we want you to come up with a way you'd rather remember the experience. And in ART, for the clinician training, they call it the director intervention. So I want you to picture being, think about being the director of a movie because you've relived it twice a couple times the way it happened. Why don't we come up with a different ending? And you can come up with any solution that you would like. So if it was a firefight, maybe it didn't happen or you're, your comrade was wounded, but taken away for medical treatment and everything turned out okay. But the, quote, patient 
can come up with any solution in any way that they would rather remember the experience as if they're changing the ending of a movie. And they would do that from beginning to end, again, following the clinician's hand with eye movement. And what we're trying to achieve with that is what's called memory reconsolidation. And it sounds sci-fi and far-fetched, but the beauty is that emotionally laden memories, the way that they're stored in the brain and in the parts of the brain, such as the limbic system, that every time they're retrieved, they undergo change, molecular change, including protein synthesis. And that happens whether we want that to occur or not. So I use the analogy, that's why eyewitness testimony is notoriously unreliable, because it's been brought up many times, it's changed a little bit because it happens naturally, and then when you try to retrieve it after a hundred times of thinking about it, it's different. Well, one of the great strengths as humans is if we have this innate mechanism that emotional memories, when they are retrieved, are automatically susceptible to undergo change, why not just change it way for the better? And that's what the director intervention seeks to do. He wants to add a positive ending, positive material to the existing memory. And I'll stop in a second, but the analogy might be changing or overwriting the file on your computer. That's what we're trying to do with memories in the brain. And the, again, the beauty is there is a solid theoretical basis for memory reconsolidation that you can actually add positive material to existing memories. So I'll stop there for now. That is so doggone interesting. I mean, there's not a person who's listening to this that isn't very, very interested in that whole process. And and yes, we do want to take that negative. I mean, the question that comes to my mind is the same one that's in many people out there. How does that take place? You said something about the physiology and the protein. Could you just say a little more about, and I know no one probably knows exactly what it is, but what is it that happens? Because the interesting is to try to conceptualize what one is actually doing with a human being in that situation so that they can even explain it better to that person even beforehand. Okay, so I'm gonna go out a, a little bit on a limb and speculate a little. So we're all as humans wired to survive. I mean, that's number one priority. And let's assume that you got attacked by a dog and you know, it was a, a vicious attack, but it happened to be a sweet looking Labrador retriever for some reason. It would be in your best interest that over the course of time, as you thought about that experience, that that dog would not look sweet and you know friendly lab, that it would look a lot more dangerous in such that you would basically form the memory, dogs are bad, stay away. Well, that's the process I mentioned about what happens when memories are retrieved, that particularly traumatic ones, that they're being altered some, and my belief is they're being altered to be adaptive and to enhance the likelihood of survival or, or, or avoiding, avoiding harm. So what that means, though, is that it's called plasticity, okay, or malleable, that every time a memory is retrieved, it has this capacity. And again, one of the great strengths of ART is it's merely capitalizing on the fact that biologically that happens, that when memories are retrieved, they're malleable and can be changed. And by the way, you know, there's drug therapy like beta blockers that are being used in a, in a similar manner to try to alter the memories as well. So it's not just psychological, psychotherapy approach. But again, the strength of ART is this, what we call the director intervention. That you can have someone think about the experience during this retrieval of the emotional memory and actually alter the way it's stored in memory and in the brain. And really what ART seeks to do is change the imagery. So we're never going to change the facts. The facts of the experience will always be the same, and the person will always be able to remember the facts as they happened. But what will happen after the session when it's successful is when they think about the original experience and the imagery of it, they won't see the old images. They'll see the new ones, the way that they thought about it with the director intervention. And that's what we believe really quiets down all of the symptoms. Well, that is absolutely interesting, very stimulating. So let's talk a moment before we go into our break in, in another moment down the road. But so how does this really differ from what's been going on with 
from the VA, uh, DOD, Department of Defense, other, what are the other methodologies and how does this contrast to those other methodologies? Why would a person want to do this in, instead of one of those methodologies? So there's a number of reasons. There are three main methodologies, not to get into extraordinary detail, that are considered first-line evidence-based treatments for post-traumatic stress disorder in the VA and DOD clinical guidelines. And they are cognitive processing therapy, which is a way of reframing the way that you think about your experiences, prolonged exposure therapy, which is essentially trying to relive it, sort of the way I described it, but desensitize yourself without the you know, the reconsolidation that I, I mentioned. Mm -hmm. And then EMDR, which we've had some discussion. Mm -hmm. All of those therapies are what are called manualized, which happens to be a good thing, but they usually require 10 to 12 sessions and sometimes some outside homework. And in at least some instances, the person doesn't start to experience relief till at least a few sessions in if they're going to experience relief at all. So, there's a big risk of dropout that's well known and some of those therapies just people can't stick with the whole course of the treatment and you know the success rates are variable with it and with ART usually but not always usually they start to get relief in the first session so I'm not suggesting it's only one session you know we can talk about our research studies and the average is always about four total but when people start to get relief in the first session it gives them hope and it gives them a reason to finish the course of treatment. Mm -hmm. So those are some really compelling reasons. And I'll give one or two others. I mentioned the fact that you don't have to verbalize the traumatic experience. And with the military, we've worked a lot with the special forces that have classified information. And we've also worked a lot with uh, you know, sexual abuse and military sexual trauma. And those are the kinds of things people many times don't want to verbalize. So those are other reasons, in addition just to the brevity and the likelihood to get some relief in the first session, that we really think it's a very, very promising and we hope to be a first-line treatment very soon. Again, I'm sorry to be so enthusiastic and effusive about it. I apologize, but it's just so, so interesting. As one who struggled with these things for so long, it's one of the reasons we put a whole page up on four vets on Core Brain Journal, and this is obviously going to be significantly included on that page. So the vets and their families can be a part of it. Now, let me run the tape back just a little bit. Uh, there are two quick questions. Again, before we take a break here, you used a term which I'm not familiar with, and I know our readers are not familiar with, manualized. What does that term mean? That's really important that, uh, you know, there's a lot of, quote, psychological interventions out there. And, you know, what are people doing when they're, you know, have the patient? client kind of relationship. Manualized means it's very structured. For example, 12 sessions and in the first session, you know, we'll cover topic A and the second one, topic B. And that is important because we're not talking about a surgical procedure where it tends to be done exactly the same each time. So manualized means there's a very strict series of steps or protocol, you know, which is generally a good thing. Like I said, 10 to 12 sessions. ART also has a very, very well-defined script. What's not quite so specific is the sheer number of sessions. Sometimes treatment is completed in one or two sessions, but as I mentioned, our average is four in all of our research data. That's so interesting. Then the other question before we take a break, and I'll have another question before the break, but this one right here is, how does one get trained in this? What's, do you have training modules? Do you have to go somewhere to get it done? Please tell us a little bit about the training process. Sure. So there are two groups out there now that do the training. Now, I've done some through my university contractually, such as with the Army, but uh, we're not doing any of that right now through my university. But there's a commercial group, and the website for that is www.art, for artworksnow.com. And so anybody that's a clinician that wants to be trained can make an inquiry on that website. And they offer trainings periodically throughout the U.S., um, more so in the, sometimes in the South and the Northeast, but they offer them periodically across the U.S. and some locations internationally. And then there's a second group called Art International. I don't have their exact website address with me. And they actually train clinicians as well. So there are two sources out there that are presently uh, conducting trainings for clinicians and for the basic protocol to learn how to use and deliver the, the technique 
for any licensed mental health professional, it's a three-day experiential training. And after that, they can begin practicing it right away. That sounds terribly interesting. Now, we're going to take a break. And this is the next question, because our audience is a group of people that are really interested in the human narrative. You've talked to some very interesting things. I've asked the questions. This isn't, I'm not saying it's in any disrespectful way, but I think it's very important that we laid the groundwork from an educational, more scientific point of view. But I'm going to ask you when you come back to give us some examples of shocking, oh my gosh, interesting things that happened to you where you were quite surprised with the situation. So we could get some, in a way, testimonials from your experience as a clinician, like, oh my gosh, I was surprised to tell you the truth. I mean, I thought it was going to go this way, and then it turned out this way, and this is what I think probably happened. So I'm going to ask you that question. We'll be back, folks, in just a moment. Well, you folks already know that here at Core Brain Journal, we're on a mission to introduce you to resources that make significant contributions to the investigation of those predictable mind science applications. Our colleagues at DHA Lab Group provide a real difference with treatment options for people at every level, from first awareness of mind problems to those frustrating times when even well-informed treatment becomes surprisingly unpredictable. For my entire professional life, from psychoanalysis to brain scans, I've searched for, yes, improved predictability. The good news for all of us, from professionals to patients, remarkably effective research offers useful, cost-effective, organic options far beyond guesswork with psychiatric medications alone. DHA lab tests measure unbalanced biomedical details through easily available testing, now available globally for a variety of molecular answers from, for example, methylation, copper, and cryptopyrrole challenges. Check in for more details at dhalab.com core. That's D-H-A-L-A-B.com forward slash core. Well, welcome back, folks. Dr. Kevin Kipp is such an interesting guy, isn't he? I mean, we're so fortunate to have his input on this terribly important and useful technique. And uh, I thought we'd just take a little moment to hear some of the uh, clinical experience of a person actually seeing it. Can, we talked about hope two or three times in that little introductory set of remarks. I think we need to build some hope. People need to say, hey, this is, may sound a little odd, but goodness knows some good things can happen. Maybe we need to step up to the plate and figure out how to get this done. So, Kevin, could you give us a couple of examples of things that actually were surprising to you as a, an experienced clinician with this modality, this technique? Yeah, if you give me a little luxury to tell a, a story, I won't take too many minutes or too no, long. Please. But I, I we can, want to hear okay, it. Good. Okay, good. And I, I have permission to tell this individual story that he's given me license to do it. So one of the things that has really struck me, and this was early on, there's an individual uh, known as Brian Anderson. And uh, before I forget, he runs a, a group now that runs retreat programs for veterans with, with PTSD, and it's veteransalternative.org. But at any rate, Brian came and saw us early in our studies, and uh, he uh, just gives some background on his situation because he allows me to do that. I think he was working at a country club up in Vermont, and 9-11 happened, and he felt compelled to go join the Army. And so he did, and he started out as a photographer, and he went over, and uh, I think it was to Iraq, and he, he saw a lot of what was going on, and uh, he also saw what Green Berets were doing. And he said, you know, I think that's what I need to do, is I need to be one of those guys. So went back and got trained as a Green Beret and then did a couple tours in Afghanistan. And he was involved in some very, very serious firefights. Uh, I think his, his group actually, I think he told me, took out the number two guy in the Taliban at one point. But in the course of his deployments, he also uh, saw a lot of combat in it, and uh, he lost his two best friends. And he saw that, witnessed the experience, it was through sniper fire. So Brian comes back after his uh, time in the service, and he's suffering badly from post-traumatic stress disorder. And he's the kind of guy that is very, very proactive. Think of a Green Beret, you know, can do it all. And he's very motivated to get well. And he goes through the conventional course of treatment, which works for some people. But he actually goes through four different courses, the last of which is 16 weeks of prolonged exposure at the Veterans Administration. And for whatever reason, he's not doing much better. He's no better, basically. And so he comes and he sees us. 
And it happened that the developer, Lainey, was, was in Florida at the time. She's housed in Connecticut. And uh, she treated him. And in one session, he got remarkable relief. And he then went on to do a couple more sessions. But his story is so compelling that he was so motivated. He tried four courses of treatment, 16 weeks, got through all of the prolonged exposure, still was not any better, and literally in one session was dramatically better. Mm. And when you see that, it's hard as researchers like myself. We don't like anecdotes. We like lots of data. <laughs> but you can't walk away from that when you see something like that. So that that's just one example. I won't go into detail to that length for others, but... You know, we've had many others. Uh, we've treated all the way back to the Korean War. You know, an 83-year-old vet still suffering and haunted by images and memories, and he got a good result. And perhaps one other thing I'll say is we have been fortunate that through Fort Belvoir Community Hospital and a terrific clinical psychiatrist who's head of behavioral health, Colonel Wendy Waits, we went and gave a presentation, and she was one of the most skeptical you could possibly be on this therapy. And based on the results that uh, have been attained at that hospital, so that's a DOD, you know, that's the sister hospital to Walter Reed up in the uh, Virginia area. She has now trained more than 100 of her providers in that method. So mm. when you see somebody so skeptical and she's, you know, a very, very disciplined with a good scientific mind and, you know, what is this voodoo? And she gave it a chance. And uh, now I've seen her come full circle that she's had 100 of her providers trained in the method. So those are just some examples. Well, you know, I'm encouraged because also as a child psychiatrist, I, I see the tremendous amount of trauma that comes up from bullying, from mm -hmm. sexual abuse, mm -hmm. from uh, physical abuse. I actually saw a woman today for the first time. I mean, when she mm -hmm. tells me what her husband is doing with her on a regular basis, I mean, it's, it's right. like a bad movie. And what he is saying to her is is just not... There's no sense in going over it because it's just right. plain old traumatic. But the bottom line is these many people from different walks of life, it sounds to me like there's a larger application for this. I wonder what your thoughts are about that. Without question, we think there's a much larger application. And, and before expanding on that, when you mentioned the childhood trauma, mm -hmm. a lot of times what will happen with ART is with our veterans and, and the civilians that we treated adults, You'll get good results on the traumas that they come in for treatment that are contributing to their symptoms. And then there are things that are repressed from childhood, mm -hmm. and those then will start to emanate, and those can be treated as well. So you can go all the way back oh and deal with exactly some of the things you, you stated there. But in terms of other applications, one of the things that happened in our randomized control trial was when we uh, got really good results for our symptoms of post-traumatic stress disorder, a lot of our veterans came in with a lot of pain. And it was, you know, head pain from a concussion or neuropathic pain. And their pain levels went way down, too, on average. And we published those results. So we're not exactly sure why that was, but we're doing some work now in chronic neuropathic pain with this approach. And I have a new study with the National Institutes of Health that's just starting. Our first patients are going to be enrolled uh, next Monday. And that's for uh, what it's called prolonged complicated grief. So that's elders that have lost a loved one after many years and are more than a year out and are still grieving very badly. And we think we'll be able to make great strides and, and you know, in that population as well. So it's just a couple examples. Uh, you know, we have clinicians working with kids and some other applications. And in addition, not just PTSD, but substance abuse and other types of disorders, uh, obsessive compulsive disorder. So lots of interest in what you might call off-label use at this point. Well, listeners, I have to tell you on the show notes, if you're listening to this in your car going to work, you want to come over to the show notes because uh, one of the things that's characteristic of uh, Dr. Kip is his He's talking about research, but he's also given us a tremendous amount of uh, good references. We got 10 super references on this very topic that'll be, all of them will be right there in the show notes so you can come down and take a look at them. And while we're talking about, we've been alluding to research in general, and, and I want to take a little more time to embrace the concept of data and research and how does that evidence line up now? Here's a researcher, here's a clinician and a researcher. He's doing the research. So let's talk about, you know, we've talked about anecdotes, we've talked about interesting experiences, we've talked about how to do it. 
let's close with a data-driven set of comments about your particular experience as a researcher reviewing the data on these interventions. Yes, so I'm glad you asked. So we've completed uh, three pretty good-sized studies today. One of them is a randomized control trial. There's a, another a fourth, a small study. And people always ask, well, what's the success rate? Because that's what you really want to know is, you know, how often does it work? And, you know, there are different metrics for that. And one of the uh, most common ones is what's, uh, there's a, a checklist called the PTSD checklist or the PCL. And it's 20 items and people rate their symptoms. And as a general rule, a 10 point drop or more on that is considered statistically meaningful and reliable. That's a, a good response. And when we look at all of our data, it's about 70%. So there's no therapy that's going to be completely effective for everyone. But uh, that's usually the uh, stock answer when people ask, what's the success rate? I say normally about 70% will respond well. And then the question is, even though we've never compared head-to-head -head against the three modalities that I mentioned, what's the success rate in those therapies? And the published literature is somewhere in that realm, sometimes you know, around that 50, 60, 70 percent. So I would say that at least in, in an indirect comparison, ART is comparable. But some of that published literature, particularly some of the older studies, were methodologically flawed that they didn't include the dropouts. So they only reported the success rate on those that completed you know, the full course of treatment, which I told you a lot of times is 10 to 12 sessions. So some of the original estimates from some of the literature were actually overstating the results. So without the head-to-head -head results, you know, which we'd really like to have, and there is a trial in process for that being done out of the University of Cincinnati, we still think that ART, our results, probably line up quite well. And again, the therapy has always been an average of three or four sessions with our approach. I mean, it's just amazing to even think about that. And I'm so glad, you know, it's funny, Kev, when I was learning about you, I just I saw a couple of hints and I said, well, hey, this is a theme that we're interested in and it seems to be innovative. And when you draw down the data like that, when you draw down what's being done, and looking at the time commitment and the hope that can be built with a person by the uh, immediacy of some kind of a response. Of course, it's not going to be absolutely immediate. I know you're not promising that, but, but there's right. a certain measure of time that's so absolutely relevant for human beings who want to see some progress in their care. I mean, it's one of the reasons, as you well know, that we're all so, and myself included, have I've been so happy with using psychopharmacology. It, it works on the short term. It doesn't necessarily work on the long term. If we're really doing right. long term care, the limitations of psychopharmacology are there because we deal with so many more variables than just just the neurotransmitter mm -hmm. swamp at the bottom of the mountain. There's so many more things <laughs> going on. Right. And so right. that is really very provocative and wonderful for you to bring it up. And I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. You know, we were talking offline before. We started mm -hmm. recording, and uh, I'm going to send you a number of people. Dr. Bart Billings was the one person I was telling you about. And, okay, great. Uh, and I'm going to send you the uh, fellow who did the EMDR training who I couldn't find him. I was kind of listening to you and trying to call him yeah. out. Couldn't get it done. And there's another guy that you're going to very much enjoy listening to, Dr. Doug Knoll, who is a, uh, a legal expert. He's a uh, jurist doctor. Uh, a lawyer with a PhD in, mm. in law, and uh, he is very strong on how do you handle arguments and, and conflict, but the kind of things that you're talking about when they're unresolved bring arguments and conflict because they're unresolved. And I know Doug would very much enjoy listening to you and, and, and talking with you, so I'm going to hook you guys up offline. That'd be great. I'm, you know, always interested in talking with anyone and collaborating. And, you know, my goal is to uh, not be a one-man show here. Not that I'm entirely, but we've done the bulk of the research. But I'd like to partner with anybody that also wants to, uh, you know, try to examine and disseminate this therapy, you know, as best. Well, we'll certainly do that. And I, I can't tell you, you know, for our listeners, on behalf of the listeners and behalf of the really many, many people who are going to be here in this program, it's a deep thanks because this is really life-changing for many. And uh, I just appreciate you bringing it on. So I want to leave it open. If you say to me at some future time, hey, Parker, we just got this thing out. or this is, We'll be happy to have you on again. We'd love to have you back because this is a little touch on it. Uh, we'll have the references that Dr. Kip recommended in the show notes, folks, with these different people, including uh, 
His name was, was it Brian Anderson? Am I right about that? Brian, right? Yeah, Brian Anderson. It's www.veteransalternative.org. I yeah. would encourage your listeners to go to that website and you can see some of his testimonials too. That's great. So we will have that one in there as well. And in closing, just thank you so much for coming on board. We really appreciate it. This Oh, I'm be, delighted. Thanks for having me. It'll yeah. be published in about probably about five to six weeks because we have some people in line ahead and it takes a while to get the production done. But just to let you know, and we'll, we'll notify you when it happens. Oh, appreciate it. And I look forward to talking in the future. Thank you very much. Thanks for coming on board. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Core Brain Journal. We're working every day behind the scenes to bring you reports that connect research benches with those street trenches. Here we share the complexity of mind science because as you know, details really do matter. One of the most pervasive misunderstood challenges is how commonplace medications like those written for ADHD are used so regularly without clear guidelines. If you think you'd like more specifics, take a minute to download my two-page PDF packed with video links and references on the absolute essentials of how to start ADHD medications. They're easily available at corebrainjournal.com forward slash start. Thanks for listening. Do connect and stay tuned. Together we can make a difference.